Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now recently I published a video where I compared some of the leading processors for Android smartphones. And in it I compared the Exynos 7420 along with the Snapdragon 810, along with some chips from Huawei and from uh, MediaTek. Now, once I published that video, people were asking, where's Intel? Why haven't I put Intel into this comparison? Well, the truth of the matter is that Intel really only have a slither of the smartphone market. 98 or 99 percent of all smartphones sold use chips based on the ARM architecture. Now, of course, Intel very much want to get into the smartphone market. And why wouldn't they? Because there are millions of units sold every single year, which would be great for Intel. However, they have not yet had much success. There was one phone that was launched this year that did cause a bit of a splash, and that was the Asus Zenfone 2. And it was well received for two main reasons. One is it had four gigabytes of memory, and secondly, it was very aggressively priced. Now, at the heart of the Zenfone 2 is not an ARM-based processor, but an Intel processor. In fact, it's the Intel Atom Z3580. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the Exynos 7420 along with the Snapdragon 810 along with the Atom Z3580. And Let's see how they compare with each other. So let's have a quick look at these three different processors. The Exynos 7420 is Samsung's homegrown processor. It's an octa-core processor that has four Cortex-A57 cores and four Cortex-A53 cores. Now this is, it uses a system called Big Dot Little from ARM, which means that there are big processors, the Cortex-A57 cores, which are used for the heavy lifting, for the high performance work. And there are four cores which are more power efficient, more battery friendly, that are used for more simpler tasks. For example, if you're watching a YouTube video, only the Cortex-A53 cores will be used. If you're playing a 3D game, then the Cortex-A57 cores will be used. Now, the uh, Exynos 7420 has a GPU from ARM as well, and that is the Mali T760. Now, next to that, we have the Qualcomm um, Snapdragon 810. Now, that's also an octa-core processor with four Cortex-A57 cores and four Cortex-A53 cores in this big dot little arrangement for performance and power efficiency. The difference between the Samsung chip is that it uses uh, Qualcomm's own GPU, the Adreno 430. Now, next to that, we have this Intel chip, the Atom Z3580. Now, it's a completely different system architecture. It's a completely different way of doing things. And Intel take the same technology as they use on their desktops and in their servers, and they try and squeeze it into a small chip for mobile. Now, it's only a quad-core processor. It's built using a 22 nanometer technology. And for a GPU, it uses Imagination's Power VR G6430. Now, it's a quad-core processor because Intel don't make octa-core processors for mobile. It doesn't have a big dot little equivalent or a HMP equivalent that allows it to have power efficient cores and uh, power and performance cores. It has to just rely on the performance and the power efficiency of its individual cores. So let's have a look to see how these three chips run in benchmarks and in real life situations and see which is the best processor. So before we go on to the individual uh, results, let me tell you about the telephones that I was using. To test the Exynos 7420, I use a Samsung Galaxy Note 5. To test the Snapdragon 810, I use a Sony Z5 Compact. And to test the Intel chip, I use the Zenfone 2. Now, of course, the first place we would turn to is Antutu. Now, Antutu is a benchmarking app. It's artificial in that it creates artificial workloads. However, it will tell us what the processor is capable of. And here are my findings. As you can see in first place is the Exynos 7420 with a nearly 70,000 uh, score. Then we have close behind that the Snapdragon 810 with 62,130. And then in third place, quite disappointingly, below 50,000 is the Atom Z3580 with a score of just 48,848. Now you'll also notice here that there is some bars in red. Now these are the uh, results after I ran Epic Citadel for 30 minutes. The idea was that if I ran Epic Citadel, it might heat up the device slightly. And if the device was being heated up, then maybe the processor would perform differently because it can't use so much energy in getting higher results. And that's actually the case. We find that all of the results drop here. The Exynos drops down to 63,070. The Snapdragon 810 drops down to 59,051. And the Atom Z3580 drops down to 47,613. So the drops seem to be uniform across the board, though in fact, the Atom Z3580 does do quite well in the drop isn't as much as the other two processors. 
Now the next test I run was Geekbench. Now Geekbench offers us two scores. One is the single core result and one is the multi-core result. And the single core result tells us how fast just one individual core on the processor runs. It doesn't matter if it has four cores or six cores or eight cores, it just tells you how fast one of those cores is. And then for its multi-core test, it uses all of the cores simultaneously to achieve an overall result. Now of course, the two ARM-based chips are octa-core processors and the Intel-based chip is a quad-core processor, so already it's going to lose on the multi-core test. However, it'll be interesting to see how well it does on the single-core score test. So here are my results. On the single core test, we find that the Exynos 7420 has the best score with 1,504. Next comes the Snapdragon 810 with 1,306. Again, disappointingly, we find that the single core test for the Atom Z3580 is only 918. Now, according to other tests that I've run, a score of 918, a score of 919 is really comparable to a Snapdragon 801, which is a 32-bit processor, or a 64-bit Cortex-A53. Nowhere near the speed of the Cortex-A57, as these results show us. So what about the multi-core tests? Well, as we expected, the, uh, the Exynos 7420 does the best with a score of over 5,000. Next comes the Snapdragon 810 with a score of over 4,000. And unfortunately, with a score of under 3,000, again, is the Atom chip. So, but we knew that was going to be the case because it only has quad core. One of the interesting things about the Zen Phone 2 is that when I started to run the benchmarks, a little notification came up saying, you really should be running in high performance mode to get the best of your benchmarks. Now, that means two things. First of all, it means that the speed that the processor is running normally day to day is not its high performance setting. And when I ran the benchmarks, I did switch over to the high performance mode. But it also means that these notifications came up before I actually started the test. Although I ran the app, I hadn't hit the start test button which means that the CPU wasn't at all being loaded. So the only reason that the phone knew that I was running a benchmark was that it recognized the name of the program that was running, which means it has a database built into it of benchmarks and high performance games that need high performance mode. Now that can be quite sinister because we don't know what other things the phone is doing in the background to compensate for the fact that it can't run these high performance tests very well. If it's only bringing up a notification, that's fine. But if it's doing other things, things in the shadows, things in the dark that we don't know, that could be a bit dubious. Anyway, what I did do was I ran Geekbench in high performance mode, and then I ran it again in its normal mode to see what the difference in the performance between the normal mode and the high performance mode was. And here are the results. As you can see, in high performance mode, there's an individual single core test of 918 and a multi-score test of just under 3000, as we've just said. However, when you run it only in normal mode, you actually find the score drops quite significantly, 755 for the single core test and 2311 for the multi-core test. So this shows us that the Intel chip cannot run all the time at high performance mode because it will just eat into the battery and that when it's dialed back a bit to give better battery life actually the performance drops quite significantly now that's an important thing that mode doesn't exist on the snapdragon 810 phones or on the samsung phone they just run at the best of their abilities and that's of course one of the advantages of having the octa-core big dot little system it has both four high power cores and four uh, power efficient cores in there which you can switch between depending on the workload now the intel chip can't do that just to round off our set of testings, I ran a program called the CPU Prime Benchmark, which as you can imagine, calculates prime numbers. And it just sees how quickly it can calculate thousands and thousands of prime numbers and then gives us a score. So let's have a look at those results. And there's nothing surprising here. Again, we find the Exynos 7420 winning. Then we find behind it the Snapdragon 810. And then quite a way behind it again, we find the Intel Atom chip. So the same pattern here is emerging. Exynos 7420 first, Snapdragon 810 second, and the Intel chip in third place. Now, of course, benchmarks aren't everything. We do have to do some real life work sometimes. So I've devised two tests here that will help us see the real life performance of these particular processors. One is to just start a game. In fact, it's the need for speed game and just see how long it takes to start up. Now, I do know that there are, of course, other things involved in this, including the speed of the flash memory. It's not only about the CPU. However, it should give us an overall feel of how fast these processors are. So let's have a look at the results. In this particular graph, lower is better, and we can see that the uh, Note 5 was able to start up Need for Speed in just 28 seconds. 
Next was the Snapdragon 810 on the uh, Sony Z5 Compact, 43 seconds. And then again in third place was the Zenfone 2, which took 47 seconds to start up the same game. Now the second test that I'm using is the Kraken JavaScript test, and that's a test developed by Mozilla to see how fast a JavaScript engine runs inside of a web browser. Now we all do lots of web browsing on our phone, so how fast the JavaScript engine runs is important for all of us. So let's have a look at those Kraken results. On this graph, lower is better, and we can see the best score came from the Exynos 7420 with a startup time of 3,753 milliseconds. After that comes the Snapdragon 810 with a score of 4,253, and then again in third place is the uh, Atom chip with 4,994. Now, as we saw, the Zenfone 2 can recognize the benchmark apps that we're running because there are really only a handful of popular benchmark apps out there and 22 Geekbench and so on. So to get around this, I've written two of my own benchmarks that Asus cannot know about, neither can Samsung and neither can uh, Sony. And I've written those myself. They've never been published. They're not out there for anybody else to find. I've got them and I've run them on these phones to see what results we can find. Now the first test does some mathematical things, some hashes, some prime numbers, some sorting, and it just runs through a series of tests and then gives us a result in seconds at the end. And let's have a look to see how that comes out. So the results here are in milliseconds and the uh, best phone this time round was the Snapdragon 810, which scored 22,937. And at 30,370 is the Exynos 7420. Now you then go almost double that time to 55,920, and there you have the Atom chip. Now that's quite a bad performance by the Atom chip. Could it be that there's some things going on in the background, it doesn't, it knows about benchmarks, doesn't know about my one, and it didn't perform that well. I did perform it in high performance mode, but the score is almost double of what you find for the Snapdragon 810. Interesting. My second test is a 2D physics test. It's a test that runs droplets of water into a container and they fill up and the GPU and the CPU need to keep a track of all those droplets of water and all the motion that goes on inside that bucket as more and more water is poured into it. And what happens is that a new drop of water is added to the animation every frame. Now, if the CPU can't keep up, it starts to drop frames. And at the end of it, it tells us how many frames were dropped. In fact, it tells us how many frames managed to put drops of water into the simulation and we can calculate how many were dropped because the maximum score should be 5,400. So let's have a look what the results are. Well, we can see here that the uh, Note 5 managed a score of 5,359, so only 41 frames were dropped during the whole simulation. Close behind it, we have the Snapdragon 810 with a score of 5,222. And then again, in last place, we find that the Atom dropped almost 4,000 frames and couldn't cope with all of those drops of water in the simulation. So again, using my benchmark, which no one else knows about, the Atom did really, really bad. Now, one thing you have to talk about when you talk about performance is battery life. Because if we had a phone that was really, really thick and we stuck a really, really big battery in it, then it could afford to crank up that CPU to higher clock frequencies and it could do more work and produce more heat, but the performance would be great. Of course, we don't want that. We want thin phones and we don't want them to overheat in our hands. So I did some battery tests just to see how well these phones cope under different circumstances. So to test the battery, I did two things. One is I ran Epic Citadel and let it run for half an hour and see how much battery was used in that time and then use that to extrapolate on how much you could run Epic Citadel from a full charge. In the second test, I use an app that I wrote myself, which brings up a web page every 20 seconds. It loads it up over Wi-Fi, displays it, waits 20 seconds, then brings up a different web page, sites like the BBC, CNN, and so on. And I let that run for an hour and see how much uh, battery loss there was during that hour and use that number to extrapolate. So here are the results. And as we can see, the uh, Snapdragon 810 and the Exynos 7420 can run this game for 300 minutes. Now we must note that the Snapdragon 810 is found inside of the Z5 Compact with its 720p display and the Exynos 7420 is found inside of a Note 5 with its 2K display. But even so, taking that into account, they can both play it for the same number of minutes. However, the Atom Z3 580, which is using the Zenfone 2 with its HD display, only managed 250 minutes. Minutes. 
Now when it came to my web browsing test, we find that again, the Snapdragon 810 and the Exynos 7420, I have the same measurements at 10 hours, 600 minutes. However, the Atom Z3580 can only manage 461 minutes. Of course, all of these phones have different size batteries. If you have a small battery, it will go down quick. If you have a large battery, it will go down less. So we need to compare this battery usage for web browsing to how big the actual battery is. So what I did was I took the battery size, divided it by the number of minutes, and that gives you a rate of how much battery in milliamp hours is used per minute of web browsing. And that levels the playing field across all of these three phones. And here are my results. We can see here that the Snapdragon 810 inside the Z5 Compact does the best. It uses just 4.5 milliamp hours per minute of web browsing. The next comes the Exynos 7420 in the Note 5, which uses 5. And then in last place, again, we find the Atom Z3580, which uses 6.51. So regardless of the size of the battery, this is how much energy is used when surfing the web on these phones. So what does all that mean? Well, unfortunately, the Atom chip came last in every single one of our tests, both in performance and in battery life. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, we have to understand that it's actually a slightly older chip, but also it shows you that the Intel chip isn't very popular because people aren't building phones with their latest chips. Now, the Silvermont architecture was announced in May 2013. I'm recording this video at the end of 2015. The actual chips themselves were released somewhere in the middle of 2014. So we, almost a year went past from when the chip was announced until when it first appeared. And then another year went past until March 2015 when the Zenfone 2 was officially launched. So what does this mean? Well, actually, if we look at how Intel prioritized its mobile chips, we find that really it doesn't take mobile seriously at all. Because in 2013, other chips based on the Silvermont architecture were released for desktops and servers. And then it took another six months before Intel released the chip for mobile and then another uh, year until the phone was released by Asus. And of course, they were using that chip in the development cycle there. So the problem is that Intel take chips that are designed for servers and desktops and they try to shoehorn it into a mobile chip and they don't get it right. ARM, on the other hand, only make designs for low power situations. All of their chips are designed to only use a certain amount of energy. If it doesn't use that amount of energy, they go back and they redo the design and check again and rerun their simulations until that particular budget of energy and thermal budget is actually met. Now, Intel have the capacity to make a really good chip, but they haven't really been serious about it yet. And until they do get serious, ARM-based chips are going to be the best ones for our smartphones. Well, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. I really do hope you've enjoyed this video. Please use the comments below to tell me what you think about the difference between ARM-based chips and Intel chips or between Samsung, Qualcomm and Intel-based chips. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel and also find the links up there for where you can follow me and Android Authority on social media. Also, don't forget to check out the other videos that we are making. And as for me, I'm going to see you in my next video.